In this video, we're going to start talking about 3D rotations. And what we're going to do today is cover the special case of 3D rotations where I have some vector v and some axis n where the axis of rotation called n is perpendicular to v. And I want to rotate the vector v about the axis n by some angle theta to generate some new vector called v prime. And we're going to see that by solving this special case in which the axis of rotation is perpendicular to the vector, this is going to make solving the general case where any arbitrary vector is rotated through any arbitrary axis very easy. What I'd also like to do is talk a bit about quaternion exponentials in the setting of 3D rotations. The reason being is that in the last video on the, uh, complex numbers and complex exponentials, I claim that if you have some complex number, let's say v, you can also interpret this as a vector, v, a two-dimensional vector, and you want to rotate by some angle theta, what you do is you multiply by e to the theta i power to generate your new complex number slash two vector called v prime. What we're going to find is that we can derive a very symmetric formula. It looks almost identical to this formula in the case of 3D rotations using quaternion exponentials instead of complex exponentials. Now, if you sit and think about 3D rotations a bit, you may agree that they are a bit more difficult to do than 2D rotations. Uh, one reason for this might be that there are actually infinitely many rotational axes that you could use. I could use that axis, for example. I could use that one, or that one, or any other rotational axis. And we're going to call these rotational axes n hat, n standing for normal, and the hat mark standing for unit length. That is, the length of n hat is equal to 1. Now, why do we call it normal? Well, if you think about a plane, this two-dimensional surface, this surface has a vector, or really a collection of vectors, which are perpendicular to the plane. So if you imagine this plane, I could draw a vector which sticks out of it, let me call it n hat, at 90 degrees to the surface. And if I know the plane, I know the normal vector, more or less. If I know the normal vector, I also know the plane. So I can go back and forth between these two concepts. This whole business about planes and their normal vectors is important for our special case of 3D rotations, for the reason that we're only concerned with vectors which are perpendicular to n. And if they are perpendicular to n, that means that they live on this plane that I've been talking about. So such a vector that we're going to deal with might be that one, which lives on this plane. Let's call it v. So that's the important concept there. And by the way, all of these normal vectors and the planes associated to them are going to pass through the origin. So having talked about those concepts, let's launch right into how we're going to do these 3D rotations, at least in the special case that I'll be talking about. So there's a plane there. And as I said, all these planes are going to pass through the origin. And these normal vectors are also going to pass through the origin. So I have a plane. I have the normal vector sticking right out of it, perpendicular to the plane. And let's suppose I have some arbitrary vector, which, again, it lives right on that plane because it's perpendicular to n. So I'll just notate that right there by the right angle sign. Let's call that arbitrary vector v. And what I'm interested in doing is taking this vector v and rotating it by some angle theta to generate v prime. And there's that angle theta right there. So the question is, given our axis of rotation n, the starting vector v, and theta, what is the formula for getting from v to v prime? Now here's what I'm going to do, and this is really the crucial insight to solve this problem, at least from the point of view of vector analysis. I have my normal vector n hat and my vector v. So from those two vectors, I can always calculate a cross product, which is going to be n cross v. So let me write that here, n cross v. And the vector generated here is going to be perpendicular to both v and n. And since it's perpendicular to n, this vector n cross v also lives on this plane. In fact, it's going to look like this. Since it's also perpendicular to v, I'm going to draw it at approximately right angles to v. So there's my vector n hat cross v right there. 
And what I'm going to do is draw this picture over again. And we're going to see how we can write V prime in terms of V and in terms of this newly generated vector N cross V. Here's the picture that I just drew. I just moved it up here to the upper left. I should point out a couple things about N cross V. So I drew it in that direction as opposed to that direction because there is another vector going this way which is also at right angles to V and N but I draw it this way because of the right hand rule. And furthermore, V has the same length as N cross V. So you could imagine drawing a circular arc starting from V going to V prime and finishing at N hat cross V. So all of these vectors are radii of the circle of that arc. So that's just one thing to point out. I'd like to redraw this picture in two dimensions where this vector n sticks out of the board. So imagine this coming right out of the page at you. So that's n hat. I'm going to draw v going to the right. There's v. And going upward like this is going to be n cross v. And let me attempt to draw that circular arc that I was talking about. And my newly rotated vector v prime there's v prime might be right there and that angle is again theta so what i'm going to do is as i said i'm going to write v prime in terms of v and in terms of n hat cross v and the way i'm going to do this is project v prime onto v to generate some smaller vector going from here to here and i'm also going to project v prime onto n hat cross v to generate another vector. So what I claim is that v prime is the sum of this vector right there, that horizontally projected vector, and of that vertically projected vector. Now the only question left to be answered is what are these two vectors? Now you notice that this small vector is in the same direction as v which means it's just some scalar multiple of v. And that scalar multiple should be less than 1, because it, it's a smaller vector than v. Now the question is, what scalar times v is that vector? Now I claim that from the trigonometry here, that this vector from here to here is cosine theta times v. And hopefully you can see that, because it's the adjacent side of this right triangle here. And likewise, this vector from here to here is the same as this one, really. So it's really the opposite side. And I hope you can see from the trigonometry here that that vector is sine theta times n hat cross v. Again, this vector is in the same direction as n hat cross v. It's just a scaled down version of that vector. And the answer to the question of what scalar factor that is, it's sine theta in this case and it's cosine theta in this case. So our conclusion is that V prime is the sum of this vector, which we found to be cosine theta times V, and this vector here, which was sine theta times that other vector, n hat cross V. And that is really the main formula of this video. So we've solved the problem that we posed to ourselves at the beginning of the video. If I have some vector v and some angle that I want to rotate it through called theta, if it just so happens that the axis of rotation n is perpendicular to v, this is the formula I could use to rotate the vector v. Of course, we haven't answered the general question of how we rotate v through any axis n, but we've solved a good chunk of the problem, and you're going to see from future videos that this is the majority of the work needed to solve the general case here. So I could end the video right there and just say, okay, here's how you do the computation now. It's your job to do it. But as someone who believes in keeping the abstract nonsense to a minimum, let's actually do a computation. Here's the computation we're going to do. We're going to rotate the vector v, which is 1 minus 1, 0, 
by pi over 3 radians, or 60 degrees, about the axis n is 1, 1, 1. Now, I claim we can solve this problem with what we've just discovered because v is perpendicular to n. And I know that because if I take the dot product between v and n, we get 0. Now, another thing we've got to take care of is that I define n to be 1, 1, 1. And you'll notice that the length of n is the square root of 3, which is not equal to 1. So what I'm going to do first is convert this vector n to the corresponding unit normal, which is easily done. I know the length is, is the square root of 3, which means the unit normal is going to be obtained by dividing all the components by the square root of 3, dividing by the length. So here is the unit normal we're going to work with. So let's start to see what our formula is going to tell us. So our, our formula says that our newly rotated vector, v prime, is going to be the cosine of pi over 3 times the starting vector v plus sine of pi over 3 times n hat crossed with v. Now, the cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half, so that means we'll have 1 half times v plus, and the sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2 times n hat cross v. That should be a cross. But you can see the concept here already, that the newly rotated vector is some combination of the starting vector and of n hat cross v. In this case, the coefficients happen to be 1 half and root 3 over 2. At this point, the only thing I really have to compute is what n hat cross v is, which I'll just tell you what that is. So what I have is 1 half v, which I already know is 1 minus 1, 0, plus root 3 over 2, times n hat cross v, which I find to be 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, and minus 2 over root 3. And you can check that this vector that I just got is indeed perpendicular to n, and it is perpendicular to v. And it's also in the right direction, using the right-hand rule. So now all I have to do is add the components together to find my new vector. So looking at the first component, I'm going to have 1 half times 1, which is 1 half, times root 3 over 2, times 1 over root 3. The root 3s cancel, so I'm going to get 1 half plus a half. So my new x-coordinate is going to be 1. My new y-coordinate is going to be minus a half plus 1 half, which is 0. And finally, I have 1 half times 0, which is 0. Then I have root 3 over 2 times the reciprocal, so it's going to be minus 1. So I find that v hat or v prime is 1, 0, minus 1. Even though we've learned quite a bit about 3D rotations from deriving this formula, I claim we can learn a bit more by involving quaternions. Now, if you haven't heard of quaternions, I encourage you to check out my video on quaternions where I show you what they are and how to multiply them. So what I'm going to do is define three new quaternions, and I'm going to use the interpretation of quaternions where it's a scalar and a vector combined together, as opposed to four real numbers. So I'm going to define the quaternion v as zero in the scalar part, and v, the vector v, in the vector part. So I'm just taking this vector and loading it into the vector part of the quaternion and letting the scalar part go to zero. And correspondingly, the rotated vector, in this case rotated quaternion, is going to be zero in the scalar part and v prime in the vector part. And finally, I have n, which as you may guess is going to be zero in the scalar part and n hat in the vector part. So what I'm going to do now is just notice something quite interesting. Let's take the quaternion n and multiply it by v. So I'm going to calculate the quaternion product n times v. So just following the rules of quaternion multiplication, I have the product of the scalar parts, which is going to be 0 times 0, which gives me 0. And then I'm going to have minus the dot product between the vector parts. So I'm going to have minus n dot v. 
So that's going to be my new scalar part. And now my new vector part is going to be 0 times v, which is 0, 0 times n, which is also 0, and finally n hat cross v. So my new vector part is n hat crossed with v. Now, what is the scalar part? What is n dot v? Well, I suppose that all these vectors are perpendicular to n, so this scalar part actually goes to zero. So I'm left with a quaternion, which is just a vector part. So what I'm going to do is just call n times v, the quaternions n v. I'm going to abuse the notation, just write this as the vector n hat cross v. Now, what was the point of doing all that? Well, now I know that n hat cross v can be substituted right there when this is interpreted as a quaternion. So what I'm going to do is take this whole equation and just write it in quaternion form. So instead of uh, the vector v prime, I'm going to write v prime, and that's equal to cosine theta, which is just a scalar, times the quaternion v, just v, then plus sine theta, which is just another scalar, times nv. I'm just going to make that substitution that we just found here. Now, what's nice about this is that I can actually factor out a v. So I'm going to factor out a v to the right. And what I'll get after factoring out that v is cosine theta plus sine theta times n, all being multiplied on the right by v. Now, this expression that I notice here, cosine theta plus sine theta times something else, in this case n, is always a very interesting expression when it arises. But what I'd like to do is show you something cool about this n, especially when I assume n to be a unit normal vector, or when I assume n had to be a unit normal vector. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the quaternion n and square it. So what does that mean? It means I take 0 n hat and multiply it by 0 n hat. Now I just follow the rules for quaternion multiplication. 0 times 0 is 0. Then I'm going to have minus the dot product of n with n. So that's going to be my new scalar part. Minus n hat dot n hat. And now my new vector part is going to be 0 times n plus 0 times n. And then plus n hat cross n hat. So my new vector part is going to be n hat cross n hat. But I notice that n hat dot n hat, any vector dotted with itself, is the squared magnitude, or the squared length of that number. So that's the new scalar part. Now, any vector crossed with itself is the zero vector. So the, the vector part actually goes to zero here. Now remember what the length of n was, that was one. So actually my new scalar part is minus one, and it's zero in the vector part. So this object that I get out from n squared is just a scalar minus one. So I see that n squared is actually minus one, which is very interesting because if I took this expression cosine theta plus sine theta times i, remember i has the property that i squared is minus one, we would know exactly what to do with it. We can just use Euler's formula and write it as e to the theta times i. Now what I'm going to do here is do exactly the same thing, except with quaternions. I have this object here, n, which squares to minus 1, so I'm going to use the quaternion form of Euler's formula, which is actually a thing. It, it, I have proof of it in, a, in another video. So I'm going to write this first quaternion here as e to the theta times n. As you can see, it's the same thing as complex numbers, except I have an n instead of an i. But they have the same algebraic property. So I'm going to write this as e to the theta times n times v is still equal to v prime. And this is that formula I was talking about that is exactly analogous to what we found for the complex numbers. This is more of an abstract insight that we've just derived. That is, if I have some quaternion v, which looks like this, 0 in the scalar part and some vector here, and if I multiply it on the left, by the quaternion e to the theta times n, where n is 0 n hat, and if it also turns out to be the case that n, this vector n here, 
is perpendicular to the vector v, then the effect of multiplying by e to the theta times n is to rotate the vector v by that axis, the axis n by the angle theta. And that generates your new quaternion v prime, which you can just read off the vector part to find what the newly rotated vector is. So again, we see the power of the exponential of a complex number or the exponential of a quaternion in terms of uh, understanding rotations. And if you want to play around with this expression, one challenge I have for you is to, well, first we have to remember that quaternion multiplication is not commutative. So multiplying by e to the theta n on the left may not have the same effect as multiplying by e to the theta n on the right-hand side. But one thing I'd like you to prove in preparation for the next video is that v prime, if it's equal to theta n times v, this is also equal to v times e to the minus theta n. In other words, if I wanted to commute these two, I can do so, but I'm going to have to stick a minus sign up there. And again, this is all in the special case where the vector v is perpendicular to n. Let me show you a neat little calculation that we can do with this quaternion formula. What I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the vector 0, 0, 1, which is that vector there. That'll be my vector v, 0, 0, 1, which written in quaternion form is actually equal to k, which hopefully makes sense because when you write this vector in ijk notation, it's indeed k. So I'm going to take this vector, or the, I should say this quaternion k, and I'm going to rotate it with respect to the axis 0, 1, 0. So this will be my n hat. So n hat will be 0, 1, 0, which written in quaternion form, this is actually the quaternion j. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose my theta to be pi over 2, or 90 degrees. And let's plug and chug. Let's see what happens when I plug this up into the formula. So I get e to the pi over 2. And what was n? That was j. And v was k. So this may look a little strange, e to the pi over 2 times j, but I claim it's just as uh, easy to do as complex numbers. For example, if I had asked you what is e to the pi over 2 times i, you would say that's i. So just switch that i for a j. So e to the pi over 2 times j is j. So I have jk, and in quaternion multiplication, j times k is equal to i. Now, translating the i back to vector notation, this would be the 3 vector 1, 0, 0. So my v prime, v prime is right there. And you can see that this is indeed the rotated version of v. So I think we've learned quite a bit about 3D rotations just by talking about this special case in which the vectors that you're trying to rotate are perpendicular to your axis of rotation. And as I've suggested, we don't really need all these quaternions to do three-dimensional rotations. But if we do talk about them, we gain this additional insight about the exponential and how that connects to complex numbers. But you could always tell me, go shove my quaternions up my ass and do 3D rotations with uh, three vectors and cross products. In the next video, we're going to tackle the general case. And the model there is going to be any vector, any axis. So hopefully you'll join me for that one. And if you enjoyed this video, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel, leave your comments, and like the video. And I thank you for watching.